Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today, and uh, thank you for joining us for this fifth Academy Camp of the European Capitals uh, for Culture Capacity Building Project, which is a project that has worked a little bit over two years with the idea of servicing ongoing and designated European Capitals of Culture with a series of activities that we hope uh, at this last phase uh, of the project that have been useful uh, for these academy camps. It is a project that was launched by the European Commission, Directorate General Education and Culture. And to uh, give the start of this academy camp, I would like to give the floor to uh, Sylvain Pasqua, Team Leader for European Capitals of Culture at uh, the Directorate General of Education and Culture at the European Commission to say a few words of welcome. Thank you very much, Silva, for being with us today in the name of all of us. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mercedes. And thank you also to all the members of the consortium who have been so actively engaged in this uh, European Capital of Culture Capacity Building Scheme. I know that you've been working extensively, also in very difficult uh, circumstances, because it, it all began in October 2019. And by the time, Europe was completely different. Uh, we were not uh, thinking of what was ahead. We had no clue about the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which was about to start and to completely change our working methods. Uh, and of course, now, as the pandemic is a bit away, maybe it will come back, but we have also a war uh, so close to our borders. And this has also an impact on how we work and how we want to include in our daily uh, practices uh, those people really fighting for the values uh, European Capitals of Culture stand for, and uh, namely all the, the artists and cultural organizations in, in Ukraine. So I'm very happy to be with you today and to also discover the, the outcome of the two and a half a year of work you've been doing with uh, upcoming current European Capitals of Culture. And I would like also to say that this project corresponding to the raison d'être of the European Union, because it's all about the transfer of know-how, knowledge between past, present, future European Capitals of Culture. And this is what you have also at the center of Creative Europe. The idea that by working together, you learn quite a lot. You try to avoid the mistakes made by others, but also to take advantage of the very good practices that have been uh, developing. So, you know, in a sense, what you've been doing in 30 months is really what the European Union is trying to, to do since its, its very beginning. So that's why this, um, this project is very important. And through the toolkits produced, through the podcasts also uh, produced, I hope that um, uh, it will, the project will also help cities, whether they want to become European capital or, or culture or not, in further developing their connection with, with culture, the connection between culture, Europe, and uh, the, the future development shaping of, of cities. So that's really a huge ambition. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we will all, all of us together discover uh, along the two days of this final academic camp that that is what you have been doing and that is a, a huge legacy of your project. Many thanks. Thank you so much for being with us again and, and um, Sylvain and uh, of course Siri also who's uh, with us. Huh? Good morning Siri from DGAC. Thank you very, very much for, for the trust that you uh, deposited uh, in, 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 in the consortium that has led this uh, this project over these uh, two and a half years. Um, before delving into the uh, program itself, let me pick up on, on what you have said, Silma. Indeed, this has been about working hand in hand with the European capitals of culture and not only for. I, I, I really want to underline this because it has been uh, the, the, the backdrop to, to the project has been to understand how we could be of help, how we could accompany the ongoing and designated capitals of culture with uh, a series of activities uh, during these two and a half years. So at the very start of the project, it was about understanding uh, where there were gaps, where there were needs, 
and how we could work again hand in hand with the European Capitals of Culture. So this is a project that has been led by a consortium. I, I think that it's due <laughs> that I speak in the name of the consortium. It is led by the European Association for Information on Local Development uh, with, uh, in partnership with Culture Action Europe. NCAT, uh, the European Network on uh, Cultural Management and Training, uh, with uh, InterArts and with uh, UCLG uh, Committee on Culture. So it's been, again, also, you know, the idea of a cooperation process, uh, as you have said, Silva, also from the side of the consortium. Each one of the partners has put at uh, the benefit uh, of the project its know-how and its expertise. Um, so we started from an analysis, a literature review, uh, a series of surveys, focus groups to understand where we were coming from, where we were at with the European capitals of culture in terms of their needs of uh, competence building skills and capacities uh, needs uh, for their delivery teams. So that was the first big bulk of the project. And on that basis, we gleaned also the uh, topics uh, that were of interest for uh, the uh, design and implementation of a training program, which uh, we have called the Academy Camps. Um, the Academy Camps, uh, there have been four plus one today, the fifth, uh, four Academy Camps that, as you have said, Silva. Uh, were imagined in a certain way previous to the pandemic, but uh, we had to really, uh, well, be as creative as possible and energetic as possible and pull from all the resources that we had at our disposal uh, to make things happen during a very difficult period. Indeed, the first Academy Camp on audience development took place in October 2020, which I think gives us an idea of, you know, the challenge that we faced at that time to implement it with and for Elefsina. And from that, we moved on to Academy Camp number two on the potential of, digi of the digital for the European capitals of culture, but also, as you have said, uh, Sylvain, beyond uh, the European capitals of culture, for cities in general and for cultural projects and activities in general. We did that one also fully online with the uh, delivery team of Chemnitz. And we arrived to the third uh, Academy Camp on International Cultural Cooperation with and for Vesprem, uh, the European capital of culture, Vesprem Balaton, and at that point, we were able to do an academy camp that was hybrid in format. Uh, there are indeed some lessons learned from uh, going fully digital, um, but we did want to uh, maintain as far as possible the possibility of being in presence and working hand in hand with the delivery team. So Vesprem uh, was done in a hybrid format, as was the fourth academy camp on community, community development, excuse me, and uh, creative projects, huh, which we did with and for Timisoara, again, in a hybrid form. So these four academy camps have been about delivery of a training program, but also, uh, and I'm picking up again on what you have said, uh, Silva, making available to a wider audience, not necessarily of the delivery teams of European capitals of culture, the knowledge and the information generated through these academy camps. So the, the material is fully available online, huh? the written material, but also the uh, recordings of the training sessions for those who you know, might want to listen to what was said. And from the programs, uh, with the help of, uh, the, uh, with, of ENCAT, we have uh, produced a series of podcasts, uh, very specific uh, podcasts on, 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 on concrete issues with the voices of the experts that have intervened in the academy camps. So we think that we're leaving a legacy uh, after this project uh, that we hope will be useful for the European capitals of culture indeed, but for professionals in the cultural sector at large. Further to the academy camps and, and, and all of the material that has been generated, 
we have also uh, provided a database of experts for the European Capitals of Culture. So that is also made available for the European Capitals of Culture who might want to uh, commission uh, a professional service to uh, one of the experts in the database. And finally, there is of course a repository of literature, research, documents uh, that is also made available. So all in all, to say that it's been uh, two and a half years of intense work, huh? of, of a lot of uh, communication exchange with the European capitals of culture. We have participated systematically whenever possible to the meetings of the family huh? of European capitals of culture to also have their feedback. And we uh, hope uh, that what has been generated will be of use uh, for the future, uh, uh, for anyone who might be interested in the topics that have been tackled. Now, this last Academy Camp uh, is uh, under the leadership of uh, Jordi Pascual, uh, Committee on Culture, uh, UCLG, one of the partners in, uh, in the project. And the idea behind this in, in, very, in, in a very few words, in very few words is about talking, exchanging uh, with the team leaders of the four previous academy camps in a conversation. Uh, so it will be an, a conversation open also to the rest of participants. First with the expert leader, uh, train, training leader, but then with the participating European capitals of culture slash spin-off uh, projects, experiences that we have had uh, relation with and that have participated in the project itself. It's about uh, pooling together knowledge, uh, indeed, from the various voices that have participated in the project. And we think that this is extremely important. It's about you know, listening to each other, understanding from each other, and of course, learning from each other with the uh, input uh, of everybody who has taken an active part uh, in this uh, uh, European Capitals of Culture Capacity Building project. So without further ado, thank you very, very much uh, to all of you who have been active in this project during these uh, two and a half years. And uh, Jordi Pascual, the floor is yours to launch uh, this fifth Academy Camp. Thank you very, very much for your cooperation. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much, Mercedes. I am delighted to, 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 to chair, to convene this, this conversation. Uh, it is truly a conversation. Uh, this is why uh, I am I will now introduce Cristina, the, the leader of the first Academy Camp that took place in, in Elefsina in, uh, almost two years ago, in October, November 2020. But it is meant to be a conversation. Uh, first, Cristina, myself, but Mercedes, please feel free, you know, to, to, to take the floor, to ask Sylvain, specifically also, please feel free to, to add, comment. Uh, I've just seen that uh, Aidel, the leader of uh, this partnership, has joined. Uh, feel free also to take to take the floor, and we will be uh, building capacity with this conversation during the next hour, uh, and after a, a short break with uh, representatives from uh, European Capitals of Culture, LFCNA 2023, and Rijeka 2020 will give the floor to Angeliki Lampiri, to Yanis Kaukmas, and to Tania Kalcic uh, to explain uh, audience development in their, in their cities. Let me first introduce Cristina de Milano. Uh, buongiorno, Cristina. Welcome. Uh, Cristina is one of the best known European experts Ooh. on audience development. Who, 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 who else? Uh, uh, of course you are, yes. Uh, Christina, you hold a degree in archaeology in Rome, University of Rome, and an MA in Leicester, MA in Museum of Studies. You founded uh, in 1995 ECCOM, an organization that carries out research projects training activities and consultancy, national, international, 
uh, you have been involved in several EU projects, uh, specifically most of them uh, referred to cultural access, to participation and to audience development. And you, you lecture also, so you are familiar with building capacity with your student, students, training students. You have been also involved in networking and advocacy, serving as member of the board and vice president of Culture Action Europe, also one of the members of this partnership. And you have had also responsibilities, important responsibilities in Italy as member of the board of directors of the Teatro di Roma. Uh, and now you are serving as a member of the Commission for the National Museum System of the Italian Ministry for Culture. I will ask uh, on on uh, Rome and, and 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 Italy, but let me let me pose a, a basic question: Why audience development? Why is this important? And what it is about? Thank you, thank you very much, Jordi. For, first of all, thank you for the beautiful presentation. I'm a bit embarrassed after all the nice words that you just said, and thank you to the organizers for having invited me. I'm really glad to be part of this conversation. I like the format very much. I like this to be a conversation about such an important issue as audience development. As you said, I've been working on that uh, for a great part of my life, let's say now, I can say that. So it's, it's a pleasure for me to share my, well, what I know about audience development, my ideas, my vision, and to share it in this way, in the form of a conversation. I think the first question is really very appropriate. Why audience development? And actually, this is also something we discussed with Mercedes when we were planning the first academy camp with and for the Elefsina team, which, as Mercedes said, was about audience development. So why did we decide to start with audience development? I think the answer is strictly connected to the answer I'll give you about audience development in general. Well, I think that audience development is actually, well, the expression audience development as we intend it nowadays in Europe, which means a process a strategic process of creating a strong relationship between cultural institutions, cultural organizations, and communities. So this is the definition, let's say, we are working with. And I think that such a concept is strictly related to a change of paradigm, which has been happening in, in Europe. Of course, we are talking about Europe. Everything I will say about audience development I will share with you is strongly based in the European context. And I really cannot say much about, about what's going on in other contexts, in other continents. So let's be aware that we are talking of Europe. So this change of paradigm, which is happening in Europe since I would say the end of of the 90s, beginning of the years 20s, uh, 2000, sorry, sorry, it's about um, putting people at the center of many different participatory processes of legitimizing people to have voices in many different contexts. And this is happening also in the cultural context. If we think about the model of cultural policy, which is now being developed at different levels in different contexts, which is the model of um, cultural democracy. What does it mean? Well, it means that on the basis of the big, big effect of the FARO Convention, which was published in 2005, we are looking at a change, a very in-depth change which is about legitimizing people to attribute values and visions to cultural heritage, to cultural activities, to culture in general. Let's, let's talk about culture as something very wide, uh, referring to tangible and intangible heritage, obviously. So if we assume that we are now in the middle of this paradigm change, 
which is about cultural democracy, about active participation of citizens and local communities, especially, which is about legitimizing people in attributing values to culture, then we do very easy come to the conclusion that audience development is the answer to many questions that might probably arise from such a view of culture and cultural policy being a strategic process which should enable cultural organizations and cultural institutions to put communities at the center of what they do in a constructive and very lively dialogue, which does not mean that cultural experts or cultural professionals should lose their role, but it simply means that they should be in dialogue with communities, which should have and could have a much more proactive role in defining also cultural priorities and cultural programs, for example. I, I have at least four questions for you to, to, to complement. <laughs> but let, let me begin with the, I love the definition of audience development. Brilliant. I, I fully endorse. I, I love it. The relation between institutions, cultural institutions, cultural events, including cultural events, I presume, and communities. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, you mentioned, uh, something related to a change of paradigm. In, in, in one minute, Christina, Ooh. what is the old paradigm about? Well, uh, the old paradigm was actually based on a model which we call the model of excellence, in which cultural institutions and cultural organization, organizations were seen as the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, repositories of knowledge, which was transmitted in quite a top-down way hmm, to, to people, to citizens. Then it evolved a little bit towards a model which was addressing access, but access mainly in physical and economic terms, which of course is something crucial, is something important, but it is not enough because when we talk about cultural democracy, we mainly talk about cultural access, and this is really a big, a big issue. And then it uh, changed again toward a model which we call the socioeconomic model in which we are, let's say, pushing still, we are doing that, culture as a means for social and economic development, which is fine, but again, it's just a limited part of it. So these were the three, let's say, paradigms that we have seen changing and evolving in Europe in the last 60, 70 years. And we are now working on a fourth paradigm, which is the one I was mentioning of cultural democracy. I don't know if this is clear. Cultural democracy, yes. Um, nicely, nicely explained the, the, the history. I have doubts. Uh, mm. Most of cultural institutions and events uh, in Europe embrace, in fact, the paradigm of cultural democracy. But this is, I think, something that we can discuss not only today, but uh, no. also this uh, not only this morning, but also this afternoon and, and, and tomorrow all day, because this is one of the big, big, big questions exactly. of European cultural policy. This is the problem. <laughs> yes, yes. And I would like to hear from Sylvain also on this, on this issue and how, how the European Commission and the, the European institutions position themselves in this uh, yes, change of paradigm. But let me let me go to the to the shaping of this new paradigm because I presume that the Faro Convention has something to do with this change of paradigm. Can you explain what the Faro Convention is? Who is say uh, owning that Faro Convention and and mm -hmm. how cultural uh, institutions and events are related to this Faro Convention? Yeah, I I will. So the Faro Convention, as I said, is a document published in two thousand five by the Council of Europe. And is a document that when I talk about it, I always say it's a sort of uh, revolutionary document because it, it is quite radical and it implied a quite radical shift 
from the object to the subject, to make it simple. What does it mean? That, of course, the Faro Convention acknowledges the value of heritage per se, of heritage as such. And again, when we talk about heritage, we mean tangible and intangible heritage. But the Faro Convention uh, goes a little further and beyond this idea of uh, attributing a value to heritage, which is obviously recognized and acknowledged. The Faro Convention says those values, which we normally acknowledge as part of cultural heritage, are socially built. So these values are a work in progress. They keep on changing and they are built and determined by communities. Therefore, communities have not only the right to enjoy culture as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights stated uh, in 1947. So it's not just a matter of having the right of participating, of enjoying culture, but it's also the acknowledgement of a role in defining the values associated to culture. And this role is placed in the arms of what the Faro Convention calls heritage communities, which are basically the communities living in proximity with heritage, whatever heritage, wherever we can find it. So they have the right, but they also have the duty to sort of taking care, participating in the protection and in the cure of heritage because they are active actors. Mm? They determine the values and the meanings of heritage. So in this sense, it was quite a radical document which pushed the attention, shift, make, made a shift of attention from the object to the subject. And obviously, in this perspective, audience development makes a lot of sense, because it means that it is of paramount importance for cultural institutions to create this relationship with communities because communities should have an active role in not only accessing, enjoying, participating, but also determining, defining, taking care, protecting heritage at different levels. That's very good. It, it, makes, it makes sense. I understand the relation between uh, cultural democracy, the Faro Convention, this uh, change of focus between uh, the, ob the object to the, to the subject, the emphasis in people, people-centered. This, this was already in several of the, say, development theories in the 1960s and 1970s all over the, the world, the basis of endog endogenous uh, local local development, so it's it's good to notice that this is this is uh, now firmly uh, affirmed in in uh, European documents such as the Faro such as the Faro Convention. I must say, representing UCLG, it makes sense. It is say it's fully coherent with our our uh, founding agenda twenty one for culture. So. I, I fully I fully understand. The tricky thing is that uh, how this is implemented. Mm. You you run a cultural organization. You run yes. an important event that, let's say, it has an excellency mandate. Uh, show the the the, the, the groundbreaking uh, creation. Uh, the avant-garde. Um, how do you adapt this uh, new paradigm, this mm -hmm. uh, duty to serve the community, to empower the community, with the duty to, say, carry on the excellency, if, if I may? Well, this is exactly the point. This is the crucial point. First of all, let me say that it's, I think it's been very important that also the Commission has obviously sort of embedded audience development, for example, in programs such as Creative Europe, 
So I was part of a working group which delivered for the commission a study on audience development in 2015. And from that moment onward, actually, uh, the, the concept, the idea, the vision, which is behind audience development has become fully integrated in the Creative Europe program. But not only in the Creative Europe program, I would say more general, generally speaking, in the vision of the Commission. I think this is already something very important for the implementation part, because, of course, when you are uh, looking for funding or writing projects, you have to start thinking, having in mind this idea of audience development as a strategic process. So it's already something which, in a way, forces cultural institutions and cultural organizations to think in a different way. So that's that's already something very important. If we can embed a vision like that in, in funding schemes, for example. But then the risk is that audience development is misunderstood. And this happens quite often. I've been working with many institutions in the last 20 years who were, which were keen to start a process, an audience development strategic process, but at the basis of their idea, very often there was the misunderstanding that audience development is about numbers, is about quantity, how many visitors, how many tickets sold, how many participants. And obviously the quantitative element is part of it, is part of the process, but I would say that the main feature of an audience development strategic process is the qualitative aspect, which means trying to understand the motivations behind people's participation or not participation, for example, which means changing completely the perspective, not just counting them, but trying to get in touch with them, to discuss with them, to include them in a wider discussion about the organization and the institution. And this is really the crucial point. So to go beyond the misunderstanding of numbers and to try to change approach. I think the magic word here is change. Audience development is a changing process. And in fact, we tend to implement it using many tools. One of them is the theory of change, for example, which you might be familiar with, otherwise we can talk about it later. But just to make it easy, it's about a process of changing, changing the attitude, changing the way things have always been done. And this is really difficult for many organizations, which tend to be quite traditional and tend to be afraid of changes, because change is a wonderful word, word, but change can be dangerous, because changing is also painful sometimes. And when you undertake a changing process, you might also get at the end some unexpected results, some unexpected outputs. So institutions and organizations need to be brave in order to really change. And this is the main obstacle I've always found when working with them on audience development. So the first step is, oh, yes, let's do it. Audience development is crucial. It is important. We have to do it. We want to do it. We want to change. But when they realize that the change must be internal, so it's actually them who should change and not somebody or something outside. Well, maybe also somebody or something outside because contingencies and external elements are also important. But the main change should happen internally. When they realize that, they sort of freeze. They freeze and they panic very often because of the reasons I said before. What, what are the... Let's, let's assume that the cultural institution is ready. Mm. That, that the board of directors of the cultural institution, say opera house or a, a local museum or a, a, a festival, the board, the director, the CEO is convinced. Yes, we need, we need audience development. And we are all 
accepting that this is not about figures mm. or not just about figures. It is also about changing the way we operate. Mm -hmm. What are the two, three changes that you advise for this cultural organization to implement in the next year to make audience development a success? Okay. Well, the first one is to work on an internal organizational change, meaning that you need to have people devoted to that. What very often happens is that institutions tell you, well, yes, okay, audience development can be done, but our marketing and promotion department. This is not about marketing and promotion, at least not only about marketing and promotion. So you need people trained, you need capacity building activities for your staff, and you need somebody, possibly somebody dedicated to that. Because as we said, it's about creating a relationship with communities, which is a very long and time consuming process. So you need dedicated resources for that. The second crucial element, I think, is that of strengthening partnerships with local stakeholders. Uh, we know, for example, that many institutions, such as museums, have excellent partnerships with schools. This is not enough. If we want to really, let's say, have a, a, a serious, effective audience development strategic process in place, we need those inst institutions to create strong and long-lasting partnerships with, with local stakeholders, which can be of different kinds, obviously, also depending on the kind of audience groups you intend to have a relationship. And the third element is, the third most important element to me is data, meaning knowing them, knowing the audiences, but knowing them in terms of motivations, desires, aspirations, uh, visions hmm, they have about heritage. Heritage. Obviously, there is no universal recipe for this because all the things we have been discussing so far depend on the mission of the institution. So obviously, each institution has a mission and this mission has to be strictly connected to an audience development strategic plan. It cannot be separated from that. Not all institutions should, let's say, look for uh, diversification, strong or extreme diversification of audiences, for example, it, it is strictly related to who they are and what they want to achieve. So this is a reflection that should be done before even starting thinking about an audience development strategic plan. All right, we need a new structure mm -hmm. or a, an adapted structure to the to the to the to the new paradigm, to the new reality, to the will to, 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 uh, to serve the communities. Mm -hmm. We need partnerships and we need, we need uh, data. Mercedes and Sylvain, uh, do you want to, to comment anything, to, 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 to raise a question uh, so far? Or please feel free. Well, I was very interested in, um, in this uh, first uh, discussion. And as... Um, as Christina said, um, audience development have be, has been uh, um, a priority of the Creative Europe program since 2014. Mm -hmm. So it's something on which we have been working quite a lot in, uh, in recent years. It is still there in the new program. And you know also about the new European Bar House, which is also not directly about uh, audience development, but it's about um, activation of communities. Mm -hmm. and. Um, this is a very, of course, this is very ambitious, and the ambition is clearly to um, to reinforce uh, the citizens as uh, as active participants of uh, the development, the shaping of their cities, their societies, and of course, culture must be part of the of the of the game. It is very um, difficult now to really activate people if you do not use all the means you have at your at your disposal, including cultural institutions, cultural NGOs, uh, and the connection um, 
between what, uh, what what we do and how we do it through uh, communities is really of paramount uh, importance. And I very much um, also the, um, this idea to to have people come becoming more subjects and not only objects of uh, of of. Uh, of a piece of, of art, of a piece of theater. But frankly, personally, I think that we are always as a subject. When we, when, when you go to a, um, a theater, when you go, you see a play uh, of theater, when you go and uh, look at a piece of painting, you are already a, an active um, citizen because there, there is, I think, there, there is already um, a, a discussion going on between you and the, the art of work, a bit a book, a theater play, an opera, a dance, a dance performance. Um, so I think discussion is always part uh, of, of the story when you go to um, uh, an art uh, institution. But of course, and I would uh, uh, like to insist on it, um, Christina is completely right. This this is not enough. It's it's more it, it is important to go um, a step further and to have this conversation between art institutions uh, uh, ngos to um uh, with their audience to really engage them uh, in a very active active way so i, I know it's still very much uh, a theory somehow and i fully understand your doubts also uh Jordi, when you you, um, you 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 make this opposition between excellence and the need indeed to have excellent pieces of art, excellent books, excellent um, excellent uh, theater plays, very uh, um, also pushing as the audience one step further because it would be also a bit too easy, I, I think, to uh, just ask uh, people what they want and to give them exactly what they had in their mind. I mean, it's also the, the role of art and the role of culture to push you a bit out of uh, your, your boundaries. So I would like also to, to hear from uh, Christina how she sees that. Uh, really, uh, <coughs> audience development, not, not as a way just to give to the audience what the audience wants to, 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 to no. get, uh, but also um, audience development as a way to maybe push them a little bit uh, out of their comfort zone. Can I answer? Or? Please, yes, Christina, yeah. you yeah, answer I that was, question and then Mercedes, yeah, because if you... While, while Sylvain was speaking, I was thinking about one of the most crucial issues when talking about audience development, which is co-creation. We always say that the best tool to enact, to enable an audience development process is to promote co-creation, meaning that audiences can create together with institutions or with artistic or cultural organization fine but then <clears throat> we have a problem here that some institutions some organizations would never allow co-creative process to take place because they care about quality and quality is strictly related to the idea of excellence and obviously Quality is, let's say, sort of opposed to a co-creative process in which you allow people who are not professionals to create something within the organization, within the institution. So th that's why I, I want to come back to the idea of the mission. I've been working with theaters in which co-creation was a an everyday practice, let's say, because it was in their mission hmm, also to allow people to co-create and quality was less important for them. While other theaters or museums or other organizations will simply say, no, this is too extreme for us because for us quality comes first. We have to guarantee a certain level of quality, of excellence within our activities. So we can't really open up to co-creation. And of course, co-creation can be also, let's say, done in different ways at different levels. But that's why it is so important to know exactly the mission of the organization. And as you said, Sylvain, to understand how far they can push 
this mission if they are willing to change it, to open up to new perspectives, to new visions or not. Because everything has to start from there. You cannot go to a very traditional organization and propose a very radical co-creative activity. It doesn't make any sense. So it has to be strictly linked to their mission and to the w willingness of maybe changing it or let's say slightly changing it. Mercedes, do you want to yes, raise I a do. question? <laughs> yes, comment I do. anything? Yeah, because I, I was struck by um, something that Cristina said earlier and, and I'd really like to uh, hear more from her about this. Um, you, you spoke about taking care, Cristina. Huh? the importance of taking care of uh, uh, the audience. And that uh, strikes a chord in the sense that it means um, being very close, but nurturing, you know? uh, taking care of means nurturing also the human aspects, uh, the more emotional, uh, psychological aspects of our, 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 our beings. So I would like, you know, to uh, hear more about that. And eventually, if, if you think it is, uh, is it's, uh, it's possible to see how that um, feeds into the, uh, a possible solution to the eternal dichotomy of what you were saying, you know, qualitative versus quantitative uh, assessments of uh, any uh, cultural activity slash project slash organization um, in terms of uh, generating that capacity, that, that very much needed capacity of uh, uh, going beyond um, a strictly economic approach uh, mm. to something which deals more with, again, nurturing uh, this, uh, the, the human potential in audiences. Mm -mm. Very interesting question. Well, actually, <clears throat> the, the point here is, again, time, time and resources. And before that, the willingness to try to work in this way, as you said, nourishing, taking care is a long time process. It's a very time consuming process, process and it implies is a radical change from the side of the organization because normally they are used to audiences which go to them hmm, to receive something from them. And they, let's say, tend to uh, offer what, what they have always offered to those who come to them, who get into a museum. And in some cases, they also have very strong, long-lasting relationships, for example, with schools. This is something quite traditional in museums, for example. The problem is when you start talking about other kinds of visitors, other kinds of audiences. And in that case, in most cases, they don't, don't have strong, long-lasting relationship with them. So they need to create them. They don't have the resources. They don't have the time to do that. And in some cases, they also tell you, we are not social pro operators. We are not social professionals. So we cannot really go and try to reach out to people who normally do not attend, do not participate in cultural activities for many different reasons, many different pro problems. If they do not come to us, it's not really our duty to go to them, you know? So it's, it's really a matter of shifting the idea of what is the pur purpose of a cultural institution. And for many decades, they have been used to think it is enough if we open the door, if we guarantee physical access, if we guarantee economic, uh, let's say, access through different means. But this is always the idea of opening the door and waiting hmm, for audiences to come. The effort here is to try to reach out and create stronger relationship with audiences who normally do not come. That's the point. And to do that, you need all these sort of different indicators that we were mentioning before, because numbers are not enough to tell you anything about those groups. 
but you need to know why they do not do not come, what is in their mind, what is in their hearts and in their thoughts, what is the relevance that culture has in their lives. So it's really a complete radical change of approach. And this is very difficult to be to be achieved, unfortunately. Very, very interesting. Very, very, very good. I want to, 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 to raise the question of ECOC. ECOC okay. is an unidentified uh, flying organization that lands yes. into a city, extremely dangerous uh, label, if I am allowed to be provocative, dangerous because it changes the balance of powers in a city. It gives power to new actors. It mandatory gives power to people uh, because this uh, community at the center is, is one of the criteria with which the jury uh, chooses the European capital of culture. It is also politically changing the, 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 the balances because it, it needs to be built in consensus uh, so all political options should be endorsing the candidacy and implementing the candidacy once uh, the, the, the label is given to a city. So, yeah, to, to go to the point, what are the key steps a European capital of culture, the organization European capital of culture should consider if audience development has to be at the center of the delivery program. Okay, well, yes, as you said, ECOX could be interpreted as an unidentified flying objects, actually, you're right, but I think at the same time, they represent a great opportunity in terms of audience development, a great challenge, because actually they are in the position of engaging really local communities in a common project, in a common vision, even though, of course, there are difficulties in implementing all this. And I think one of the most important thing is, again, capacity building. I really think it is crucial for ECOX to have a good capacity building program for the staff, which will be involved in ECOX, but also for the stakeholders. It is important that they, they all understand what audience development is, why it is strategic, which are the implications of audience development and what is the background of such a concept. So I think it is essential as first step to set this common ground on which then we can discuss, they could discuss and they could find maybe specific and personal, let's say personalized solutions according to the local context. Again, no universal recipes. You have to contextualize this. Being an institution, to the mission of the institution, being an ECOC, taking into consideration the local context. So the first thing to me, I know that I'm boring because I keep on repeating it, but capacity building is essential. The second essential thing is the engagement of local stakeholders from the very beginning, ideally in an ideal world, even before um, uh, finalizing the bid book. But uh, I know that very often this happens actually after the, the ECOC has been, let's say, awarded the title. Well, it, anyway, should, it, should, it should happen before. Right. It should happen before. It if, doesn't because the jury is, is, is uh, right. scrutinizing the lack right. of uh, involvement of local actors in the absolutely in but maybe you know it happens let's say more on a theoretical level rather than okay. on a practical level so of course it should happen but it should happen effectively and, and quite often it happens effectively only afterwards but anyway i think it is absolutely crucial to have these engagement phases from the the very beginning. 
meaning of the process because the read could be perceived as something which is generated by a top-down process, which is exactly the opposite of an audience development strategic vision of the ECOC. So it should be perceived and felt by local stakeholders as a bottom-up kind of development, let's say. So these are, to me, the two main steps that I would like to see, you know, even before starting discussing of a candidacy, <laughs> let's say. All right. Can you give uh, any, any example from the academic camp, uh, one that took place in, in Elefsina? Uh, do, do you want to develop a bit those recommendations you, you achieved in, 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 in Elefsina, or do you have any other examples from uh, well-built European capital of culture that deserves, uh, say, being copied or adapted by other cities? Well, I think uh, in Elefsina, uh, the, the capacity building phase was taken very seriously. As Mercedes said, we had this academy camp on audience development online, entirely online. And of course, it was not easy to tackle an issue like that fully online without having the possibility of meeting people, of having discussions, you know, aside the formal training event. So we tried to, to go a little bit in depth in discussing the topic, I would say quite in depth, but of course uh, the online uh, mode, I think it was limited, limiting the potential of what we could have done in presence, for example, but still it was taken very seriously by the group, by the ECOC uh, group, and also by the local stakeholders that they invited to participate, which were committed, were quite many, very different, very heterogeneous. And for this reason, I think the academic camp would have benefited quite a lot of being in presence and having the possibility of more, more in-depth discussions. But anyway, it was done. And I think it was effective and it was, at least we felt it as trainers as a very effective activity. And they started in advance. They started discussing it quite in advance. And also in Rijeka, we had the experience of a capacity building program, which started well in advance and engaged not only the staff of the ECOC, but also the local stakeholders on a quite long-term basis. But there, of course, we had also the chance of sort of mentoring. We were a group of trainers and we could mentor local stakeholders. We had two of them, each of us. We could, we could mentor them on audience development for quite a long time in order to build personalized, specific audience development strategic plan for each of the organization, institution we were mentoring. So I think those two are, in terms of capacity building on audience development, those two to me are very good example of uh, very positive, actually, endeavors. Good. This is understood. We will listen from uh, Angeliki. We will listen uh, from Yannis, uh, from Elefsina. I see Tania has been following. Hello, Tania. You have been following the, the conversation since the mm -hmm. very beginning. Um, I would like, before we, we finish, uh, to ask a little bit more on, on your role in Italy. Uh, we will come back in the discussion mm -hmm. with the outputs of the, the, say, the three essential dimensions. And I would also like to ask a little bit more on how to identify resistances to change or how to, to, to manage uh, the internal bottlenecks against audience development. Um, but let, let us, let us uh, go to, to, to you and to the challenges you have in the National Museum System of, of Italy and the, the activities you, you did in, in the Teatro di Roma. Mm. 
Can you explain a little bit more on, on, on those two, <laughs> two NDA awards? Well, 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 <laughs> if you talk about resistance to change, <laughs> I think these are two very clear examples of resistance to change, meaning that obviously we are talking about very traditional institutions which see change as something somehow dangerous and not always desirable. And therefore, audience development as a strategic process based on change was, was not, is not really at the heart of their objectives and their aims. So I've been trying to, in Teatro di Roma, for example, to work on audience development by having a capacity building activity dedicated to the whole of the staff from directors to uh, technicians, which was very successful, but then the implementation needed that capacity of changing and of being also ready to the unexpected results, to the difficulties related to change. And the implementation process stopped at the first obstacles. Also because, and this happens also within the museum system, there are two elements here. On the one hand, the very strong disciplinary based Uh, activities of the people who work in those institutions. They are archaeologists, art historians, uh, anthropologists, and for them it's, it's very difficult to go beyond those disciplines and obviously to start thinking about audience development, which is, which is a process which requires also other competences or at least other, let's say, curiosities hmm, or other desires hmm, to get in touch with people, to nourish, as Mercedes was saying, a relationship. So they are very, still very much, let's say, embedded in their disciplines and in the work which is connected to the disciplines. So the curatorship hmm, within a museum and the relationship with audiences is something which is seen as part of the education department and not something which is related to curatorship. So it's, a, it's really a problem of this a very strong and strict disciplinary approach on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's a resistance to change because change is painful. And it's also a matter of who is taking the responsibility for changes which is another big issue, that of being accountable in a way and taking the responsibilities to activate changes. Yes, yes. No, I, I'm, I am familiar with those debates uh, here <laughs> and there in, in, in Catalonia. Those debates, especially in the capital city, Barcelona, this is happening. Uh, this is happening everywhere in Europe, uh, yeah. everywhere in the world where, where there are big cultural organizations, this, you are describing a, an average uh, situation. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me ask just another, another question and we'll, we'll have a, a, a break. Mm -hmm. uh, or Mercedes, Sylvain, if you wish to take the floor uh, now. The question would be, um, would, would it help if the boards of directors Uh, included non-cultural voices, say uh, voices from the civil society that are in other, in other battles that are equally important to the progress of society, such as environmentalists, uh, feminists, uh, mm -hmm. activists for equality. Uh, would, it, would it help this, this change? Of course it would because diversification is not important only in terms of audiences, but also in terms of internal staff, internal members. So it would help a lot. I think it would really facilitate the process. I can give you an example. Uh, when we did the audience the study on audience development, when we delivered this study for the commission, we also analyzed some case studies. And one of them 
which really struck me. And I still think of it every time I think of a good practice in terms of audience development was the York Theatre in the UK, where actually they realized they had no young people among the audiences, which is not really strange for a theatre. But they started thinking, OK, why we should open up to, old, to young audiences, we should try to have a relationship with young audiences. And they started talking with youngsters through associations, through different organizations, which can act as mediators, because you can't really go and knock at the doors of single individuals. So you need to have relationships with local stakeholders. And these youngsters, they told them, well, we, we, we have no decision power we cannot decide anything about what you program, what you offer as in terms of cultural offer. And we are not interested in what you present, what you offer. So the board of directors decided to create a parallel board of young directors, which had the power of deciding about part of the season, of course, not all of the season, but part of the season, part of the programming activity could be decided by this young board of directors. So it was not really that they were included in the official board, which might be a next step probably, but there was a parallel board made exclusively by youngsters and for youngsters. So I think this in a way shows how things could be done and could actually facilitate a change. Good. Let's let's conclude this this first part with this great example from uh, England, uh, from York. Um, shall we reconvene uh, in a quarter of an hour, Mercedes? Is that is that okay? All right. Let me uh, say uh, yeah. So we we'll meet in a quarter of an hour in at at eleven thirty, uh, Amsterdam, Paris, uh, Barcelona time, uh, Rome uh, time also. And <laughs> please have a coffee, uh, walk a little bit, breathe, enjoy this spring, and see you in 14 minutes. Okay. Hello, we are back. It's uh, 11.30 in Central European summer time. For those that are not following from this uh, uh, fuse, uh, Welcome, uh, you too. Happy to have you here. We have been uh, learning with uh, Cristina da Milano, lead expert of the Academy Camp One of this Capacity Building for European Capitals of Culture initiative, uh, leader of the Audience Development Academy Camp that took place in. In, in October, November 2020 in Elefsina, Greece. And we have with us Elefsina, Greece. We have Angeliki Lampiri. Kalimera, uh, Angeliki, great to see you again. Uh, mm -hmm. I have to say that uh, we have met because Elefsina is one of our pilot cities, so we are in close touch with the team of Elefsina since the very beginning. Kalimera Yannis, uh, welcome. And Doverdan uh, Tania from uh, Riek Angeliki is the director of cultural tra training of Elefsina European Capital of Culture 2023. It was meant to be before, but the awful pandemic that we have uh, suffered during these two years, uh, yeah, forced. This this changed in the in the schedule. Yannis Yannis Kopmans is the director of audience development and participation. What a great position! Uh, we have been discussing with Christina exactly on that topic, and, and and you have I'm sure plenty of things to to explain. And and Tania Tania Kalcik was the head of participation and capacity building in Rijeka ECOC 2020. Uh, hugely affected by the pandemic. I'm sure, Tania, you will be able to explain how the, the disease uh, impacted over the program and, and how you managed to, 
to surf it, to to survive uh, during that that uh, awful year. Good. Um, you will you will have uh, around ten minutes each, so that you can explain uh, perhaps in this order Angeliki to give a, a frame of Elefsina. Uh, European Capital of Culture uh, and the, the, the plan, the way you have worked with stakeholders, Yannis, perhaps with more uh, specific examples of projects you are involved to, 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 to build audiences in, in Elefsina and, and elsewhere. And, and Tania after uh, with, with the examples of Rijeka. Um, I would like to devote the final hours to listening to other voices, to listening to, to Chemnitz, to listening to uh, Tartu, uh, other European capitals of culture present in this uh, conversation, other participants that do not belong to a European capital of culture but have questions, are interested in the topic. Angeliki, you have the floor. Hello, Kalimaira. Um, thank you so much, Jordi, for the introduction and thank you so much for the invitation. I wanted to begin just to do a short introduction of the city of Elefsina and the context where we are working um, for those who have never been to, to, to this small city of 30,000 uh, people. It's a really small city, but next to the capital, the Greek capital, Athens. So let's say that we are really close to an audience of approximately 5 million people. Um, Elefsina used to be one of the five most important sacred cities of antiquity. So you can imagine that inside the city, there is a huge archaeological site in the center of the city, something that it's not very usual. Um, it has, of course, it, it's also known for, um, as it was the birthplace of the trage tragedian, the ancient tragedian Aeschylus. And it's a natural port, so let's say that it was strategically, um, let's say it was selected and was transformed from the now 19th century and onwards into a productive engine of Greece. So um, inside the city, uh, someone can find abandoned jewelries of uh, cultural and industrial heritage, so abandoned um, abandoned factories, let's say, uh, that were bankrupt somehow during the history of the city. But also you can now find a lot of heavy industry, logistic, uh, logistic cluster that is, um, that is held, in, that is located in the city. Uh, and more or less the 30% of the industrial pr production, the national industrial production is still produced here. So let's say that it was selected to, to become like the industrial zone of the region of Africa. Um, the signs of industrialization, of, of course, are here, are prominent on the body of the city. It's affecting it, and uh, often it's creating this perception of a place, uh, this, and this, let's say, stereotypical image of the city, um, that is a polluted city, a dark city, but let's say that who is visiting it um, has another perception of it. Of course, the city has faced a lot of ecological destruction. Of, uh, it, it's facing a lot of environmental challenges. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, as many people came to the city to work in the industries, Let's say that it's a city of, uh, of immigrants, financial immigrants, and not only, as there are two refugee camps in a, in a close proximity in the city. And also now, for example, one of it is hosting um, Ukrainian families, for example. So um, the people that are living in the city are somehow um, migrants all of the past or of, of, of the present. Let's say that what we are trying to do and one of our uh, main goals is to create ways and methods of access to culture for communities 
that usually are staying aside. And we are trying to offer a step for further integration in the society through culture and through cultural activities. Um, we are also trying to promote uh, societal resilience and to enhance social inclusion uh, through cultural cultural programs, but are not only, and especially for people with, uh, dis uh, with disabilities, people that are belonging to different minorities, and uh, also people that are belonging to socially uh, marginalized groups. Uh, and also to create this kind of dialogue between all these communities that are situated in the city. Of course, I can pass the floor to Yanis, who is working together with the community to go on with different kinds of examples and how we are working. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so, as we know, uh, European Capital of Culture uh, is a challenge. It's something that it's, uh, ha it has a short du duration, uh, but all the citizens of the city have uh, high expectations. It is something that uh, the citizens of uh, of Elefsina especially expect a lot, but then, but also they are too uh, they are so proud about it. It is um, it's, as as we as we know, um, as we think about it, as we work about it. It's not for one year. It's not about the, the the year of the title. It's not a celebration for one year. We are trying to do to 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 communicate it as a process. We try to speak with the people, with communities, with the, all the citizens, trying to say that, okay, it's the celebration title, that all we, are, we, are, we will celebrate, all everybody will, we hope that everybody will participate in our program. But for us, uh, the main bid is to, to all this, all this um, year, all this effort that we are doing as a small team in Elosina, is to be a transformation, a transition. Um, transition, especially, is, it was the key word in, the, in our artistic program of, uh, of us. So this is something that cannot be done without the, the participation of the citizens themselves. Let me say to you a few examples so of uh, the ways that we are trying to, to involve the citizens to our program, to... When I say our program is, okay, it's the institution program, but we're trying to, to do it uh, common. So uh, last year in uh, June of 2021, um, it was the, the period just after the one year, the first, the first year of the pandemic crisis. So it was a time that we could do something. And the first thing that we've done it was to, to have a play, a theatrical play, uh, especially the emblematic poem of our national uh, poem, uh, Dionysia Solomos. Uh, the poem, uh, the name of the poem is The Free BC, Beside. So it's, it's something that came to life with the contributions, with the contribution of the residents of Elefsina and the surrounding areas. Uh, it was directed by uh, Eleni Thimio and has a participation of the Philharmonic Orchestra of uh, the city, the municipality yeah. of Lucina. All the, all the play uh, took part at the old olive mill of uh, Lucina and uh, trying to captivate the audience by reviving the struggles for the liberation of Greece. Last year was the 200, 200 uh, years from, the, from our liber liberation. Uh, so it was... Um, it was something that also we're trying to give voice to the, to the 55 resident, uh, citizens of the city, uh, a place. Uh, we, it was a, the poem, but also this poem, in this poem, added texts from them. And it was something that uh, it was crucial because in our modern uh, reality, where people with special needs are marginalized and People who do not follow social norms fall victim to physical and psychological uh, violence, and also about the women uh, that continue to fight for equality. So we're trying to 
to, to, to give voice, to give space to the people of Lucina to, to, say, uh, to say that they are besieged, besieged, but uh, they can be listened. And it was something that, um, that people from Elefsina and the surrounded areas from uh, ages, from all ages, from eight years old to 50 years, uh, to 78 years old, uh, was, the, was a, a team that, uh, that, uh, that gave uh, the voice of the Lepsinian uh, citizens um, in, uh, after the, not after, in the middle of the post, of the, of the pandemic crisis. Um, so it was it was something that was so uh, so crucial for us because uh, it was the first time after the after not after in the middle of uh, the crisis that they took part. Uh, it's it's one way that that's the way that we're trying to um, to involve people to our program. Uh, also, I want to say that two weeks uh, ago. We had Spring Forward. Uh, Spring Forward is, uh, is, uh, is the most important European contemporary dance meeting and organized by, by us and also by the UNITIVA and the, also the largest European network for contemporary dance airwaves. So the last performance, we had uh, 25 performances uh, here in Lucina, but the last performance uh, Took place in the also in the old olive mill uh, with more than two thousand uh, spectators, and uh, that the day giving a standing ovation to the artists and the participants of the Grand Bolero performance, uh, the performance by the, uh, the famous Spanish choreographer Jesus Rubio Gamo, and also there 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 have been uh, also volunteers, also citizens of the city of Palestina that they took part. So uh, you can see that uh, all this, we try the citizens to, to be in our artistic program, to participate, to have voice, and to have the confidence in front of 2,000 people that they can do it. And they can be a part of transition, a part of transform transformation of the city. That we are not only audience, we're not spectators, but also we are participators. And also we trying to design our program. And that's why we believe a lot to the youngsters. Um, this is another project that we are trying to, uh, to enforce youngsters to do their uh, own team, because as you said before, uh, Elefsina, uh, will, Elefsina 2023 will be for one year, but we hope that 10 years after, uh, those youngsters will be at the key uh, positions of the municipality, of the city, and having the opportunity to do their dreams, their artistic uh, inspiration uh, action. And that's why we have a, a program named Voices in the City, where we're trying to have uh, to have to cultivate the ground or to leave the ground cultivated by the youngsters and uh, in order to be listened and that's why we, one of the one of the first actions was to uh, to struggle for a, a skate park and i think that that, two, that happens two years ago and i think that it in this year, we will have the skate park with a donation, of, uh, with a donation, having a donation, accepted the donation. And we're trying to enforce them. So we also doing uh, capacity building programs. We are happy that we participated in the Audience Development Academy uh, program. Uh, and that was uh, an opportunity for them to be a part of the team with experts uh, and design together and to identify the creative uh, youngsters and not only of their city, to have a cultural mapping of a creative mapping of our city. So they've done it and uh, 
three week, three Sundays before ago, we we've done uh, a meeting, and they 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 uh, uh, succeed to have in our uh, yard more than 150 uh, creative youngsters in uh, from Elefsina and the surrounder surroundings, uh, people that can be uh, the the energy. For the transformation, for the transition uh, of our city, I have a lot to, to say. I also, we have a school outside in our yard, so that's why I'm. Uh, it's I don't know if you are listening the voices, but uh, okay. Now um, we are. Yes. But it's nice voices. It's nice. It's nice sound. voices. We have a, an Erasmus program. That's a, that's a students and Greek students uh, gathered together in our station. All right. No, good. Thank you very much, Yannis. Uh, Evharisto. Uh, um, also, Angeliki. What I, I wanted to add to, to what Yannis said, it's also the, uh, the Pilot Cities uh, program that you have already mentioned that we are part of it. And just to mention that uh, this core group of citizens since 2019 Um, is working on uh, the work plan on um, the uh, nine commitments of Agenda 21. And what we are trying to do right now is to implement um, some of the strands that came as recommendations through the self-assessment workshop that we did back in 2019. And what our main goal with this um, small group of citizens is to somehow update the cultural strategy of the city and to integrate the legacy plan uh, of the European capital of culture inside the cultural strategy. And hopefully this, um, this process uh, will begin in September, October of this year. And this is one of our main goal as also part of our legacy of what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, it was clear. Yes. Tania. Let's go to Rijeka, and if you can explain in, in 10 minutes the impact of the, of the pandemic in your program and especially in the audience development work that you had prepared, uh, you have the floor. Okay, thank you all. Uh, hello to everyone. Rijeka 2020 European Capital of Culture, besides the culture and artistic program, actually placed an emphasis on the development of the capacity of individuals and the development of cultural organizations and also the initiatives of the citizens of the wider local community and actually the international networking. So their participation in the project was one of the goals, among others. And actually, it was um, created um, uh, through a structured capacity building program and small socio-cultural activities. <clears throat> Additional program started in 2017, which is actually three years before the title year. Capacity building program of Rijeka 2020 uh, was designed according to the needs of the Rijeka 2020 culture program but also according to the needs of the entire cultural sector of the city of Rijeka, uh, of Rijeka in a view of creating the legacy. So uh, it was the purpose to build and strengthen the capacities of uh, professional stakeholders in the cultural sector, but also the, the wider local community. So the main purpose was to invest in people and actually it resulted in their, pers uh, in their uh, personal and professional development and also in the development of organizations and different initiatives uh, which actually were uh, strengthened and, and a few of them actually established afterwards. Uh, most of the programs were organized uh, um, as a continuous educational programs um, and it were, they were designed for smaller groups of participants. And beside continuous programs, there were also other activities like seminars, conferences, uh, summer schools, workshops, smaller workshops, and so on. Um, what is interesting is that actually through all uh, continuous programs, we had a mentoring support to the participants. So actually, on the end, there were really a lot of uh, working mentoring hours uh, through all those uh, continuous programs. Some of those programs lasted for six months and some of them even lasted for almost uh, two years. Um, main methodology actually that was used was appropriately designed for adults. So actually 
the trainers in most of the programs could connect uh, uh, could connect the learning experience uh, to what actually the participants already know. And uh, there was a support from the trainers in the process of personal learning of the participants in their self-reflection and also in participants' complete project examples and organizational development. So different participants took part in the program. Uh, there were representatives of NGOs, uh, initiatives, non-formal initiative groups of the citizens, um, uh, cultural institutions, representatives of the Ministry of Culture, of the local city authority, and uh, employees of RIECA 2020, and uh, partnering organizations of RIECA 2020, and also the ones who were not part of, uh, of the project. Um, so as everything started in 2017, there was there were really a lot of participants going through the program, and it was on the end approximately uh, um, 1,500. When we introduced the topic of audience development in Rijeka, uh, that concept was not uh, was not uh, yet defined, and actually, the audience development practices did not exist in their full potential. So the process started in 2017 with a seminar, Applause Please, and we gathered uh, representatives of NGOs, cultural institutions, local city authority, and the Ministry of Culture. And they all decided together to undertook the learning on audience development practices together. So actually after that, Ministry of Culture opened a call for the project to support projects uh, in, within the scope of audience development and they used a seminar brochure prepared from our side as, as a suggested literature. And the year afterwards, they invited us to share our knowledge uh, for, in, uh, through the workshop actually for the applicants. And this uh, collaboration actually continues. And this year we will work together on the, the development of that, uh, of that uh, open call. So thanks to uh, Alessandra, uh, we had really great uh, continuous uh, capacity building program that lasted for almost two years, as Christina mentioned. So participants, besides actually attending the intensive workshops and besides uh, going through really intensive and really important action learning sets, and they had the opportunity to work with their mentors. So each of them had a mentor with who they were working for almost two years. So as a result, it's not just that we had um, so many organizations with defined audience development plans or strategies within their organizations. So actually, the city of Rijeka is the only city in, in Croatia that actually uh, has so many organizations with defined audience development plans and strategies. But I would say that the legacy are people who are audience developers who are working in those organizations, in, in, that, in those organizations because they can actually think through audience perspective. And it really takes time to understand what audience development is. So it's really necessary to take time for the, that whole process. So, um, yeah, so I, I would just mention another great example, which is a national theater uh, in Rijeka that at that time opened the job position for audience development manager. And she's still employed uh, there and obtained, uh, she's obtaining that practice. Uh, so, as I said, we started on time, but uh, my personal opinion is that we were still late, <laughs> but we started three years in advance and we had kind of uh, enough time to find out how we are going to approach to our audience development strategy of the European Capital of Culture and uh, what will be our targets and methodology and so on. So, um, and yes, there were different obstacles that many European Capital of Culture are facing as uh, most of you already said uh, in the beginning. So, but audience development program actually was initiated. Uh, it was launched with the aim to encourage the RECA 2020 organization and the partnering organizations to think strategically and comprehensively about the audience. So that was also important part. So when we started to work, uh, we define how we are going to approach it and we were working with different groups. So we also worked with our mentors who were part of uh, the capacity building program. We were working with program managers and directors of RIECA 2020 uh, who actually, uh, with whom we were trying to find a way how to implement our audience development goals within the program because program already existed. 
Um, then we were working with all the participants of the continuous educational program. We were giving support to each other, how the program can be more accessible, not just the Rijeka 2020 European Capital of Culture program, but actually the program of all those organizations. Uh, I think that was also great because we had the meetings every month and giving support to each other. Another thing um, is that we actually gathered uh, um, a board of representatives of people with disabilities. So thanks to them, actually, we uh, prepared accessibility etiquette, which was actually afterwards circulated with uh, all cultural institutions in Rijeka. And also with their support, we did uh, different workshops on conducting sensibilization of uh, cultural organizations and employees uh, in regards to accessibility uh, challenges, actually, um, you know, for people with disabilities. Also, with their support, we did small interventions in public spaces, and we did the mapping of all cultural, uh, cultural venues in Rijeka and gave the recommendations uh, how, actually, those venues can be more accessible. And of course, we worked with the schools, which is normal. Everyone are working with the schools. So we managed to find a way how to implement the program in the curriculum for the following year and the volunteers and so on. And there were different groups. Uh, there was uh, also a citizen committee who was deciding upon um, uh, project proposals of other citizens and the business club and so on, but they were not directly involved in defining our uh, audience development strategy. I would say it, they were kind of a method. So, and yes, um, we all need to know for who we are preparing the program. And to do the segmentation, we need to have some data results. Unfortunately, um, we, we could got, uh, and we got research results in 2019, which was just one year before the title year. Um, so this is uh, the segmentation that was done uh, in, in that time. So as the strategy needs to really in focus and involve almost all the citizens of the European capital of culture and, um, and the tourists and actually the guests who are coming. So this like the general uh, segmentation for non-goers, sometimes goers and goers was the most logical one. And actually when we got the research results, we were able to then sort of broad segmentation narrow it by intersecting these three dominant levels of uh, domi dominant levels of motivational categories actually of, of cultural consumers so uh, as we got it quite late um, then we were trying to find a way to understand each segment of group and how actually bring them to the program and bring program to them uh, and of course we defined our audience development goals and the tools how are we going to to achieve all that. And when we started to implement our audience development strategy uh, a bit after the opening, unfortunately, the pandemic started and everything changed. Uh, afterwards, we can talk about it, um, uh, what happened, but uh, unfortunately, the planned audience development strategy was not implemented in, in a such a way. Um, so my question for the end would be, what is the audience development in, in, in the context of European capital of culture and how can European capital of culture cities prepare their audience development strategies? I think this is some, something that most of European capitals of culture, you know, are asking uh, themselves how to approach it. So we all know from the beginning that uh, it's so important to know for who you are preparing uh, the program. So in European capital of culture context, you need to know who is your audience. So they are the citizens and they are the visitors. And it's really necessary to find a way how to approach them and involve to become an important part of a European capital of culture project. People are the legacy and it's necessary to find a way how to bring them close to the project. So I would say the capacity building program is crucial. And, uh, and I would agree with what uh, Christina was saying before. Um, because the empowerment actually that occurred through our capacity building program, not just audience development, but actually through entire learning through European Capital of Culture project with individuals actually is the evidence of the, of the importance of the empowered individual. So this kind of an empowered position teaches one about the distribution of power and um, and actually, uh, it's about uh, culture belonging to all and not just those privileged. 
So I think it's the most important, this individual and personal development. And uh, non-cultural activity can be created if this individual consciousness actually uh, is not given. So uh, this connection between people is, is really, really important in the context of European capital of culture. And of course, there is, needs to be the understanding of stakeholders to uh, do that. This is another very important aspect because without uh, them uh, actually understanding and, and working on shifting this consciousness, uh, if we want to make it in, in fine new structures, it's not possible to do it with, without uh, without uh, their understanding. And actually, uh, citizens cannot uh, be given uh, a space uh, to, to do a change. Uh, and it's so necessary to be honest in, in that process. So as uh, Christina said, yes, the audience development is a paradigm shift and it's into actually redefining levels of commitment between individuals. So a successful European capital of culture needs to create uh, and give space to the citizens. So because without this, uh, without this human factor, uh, there cannot be a healthy base for the community and also for the European capital of culture. Thank you very much, Havala, Tanya. Very well explained and very informative charts uh, that that resume your 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 work. Just one one concept. Let's say you started by asking me why audience development. I would like to close by summarizing the answer to this question. Why audience development? If we look at data about cultural participation, we know those who participate, who have access to culture, are the usual suspects or the red fish, as we call them when we do research on that. So a very small group of people, a very small percentage of population hmm, who participate actively in cultural life. On the other hand, we know that cultural institutions are public funded, therefore, well, most of them are public funded. Therefore, as I said before, I see a, a need for social responsibility and accountability. Why are they funded by public money? Because we all think they are important. We all think that culture is relevant for our life and especially uh, all of us who are here, I think we could, easily subscribe to that. Then I do see a problem in having a very small percentage of people who actually feel culture as something relevant. And why do I see a problem in that? Well, because we know that culture has a value also in terms of making sense of the world around us, in, in terms of developing a critical thinking, and in terms of understanding the complexity of the world we live in. So I think this, this should be something that every individual in society should have the opportunity to experiment. So for this reason, that's why I think cultural institutions and organizations should hardly work on audience development. We in uh, United Cities and local governments could, could have said exactly what you, you said. We, we would have added that this change of paradigm is placing cultural rights at the center of cultural policies. Because you, you are forced, when you adopt this cultural rights explicit perspective, to relate the right to participation in cultural life to the rest of, 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 of rights, the interconnection among human rights. And you need to identify obstacles as well as vulnerable communities. And as you say, it is almost impossible to carry on with uh, that low number of uh, people actually involved in, in, in cultural policies and programs. But Mercedes, you, you have experience in human rights and cultural rights, so it's now time for you to, to close this session. And, uh, thank you, Jordi. I, I'm, I'm flattered. As Cristina was saying earlier, I'm flattered for your trust in me. I can only say that it's been a pleasure uh, listening to you all and that an enormous thanks to Tanya, Yanis, uh, Angeliki, and of course, uh, Christina and, and yourself. 
I think that it's been an interesting conversation. And, and without delving into this issue of rights, I, I do have three things that I, I have jotted down as, as takes away, takeaways for me. The first is the absolute need that we have to invest in people. This is a concept that is very dear to the European Commission and the Union, actually. Yeah? Let's all remember the old, old program, Investing in People. But if you Google Investing in People European Union, uh, there are fact sheets on this as well. Also, as regards, for instance, the Creative Europe program, which to me does not only mean empowering people, and, and we have heard this this morning, I think that it is about giving power to people. I think there's a very subtle difference between empowering and giving power. The second idea is the importance and the need to vie for change. And I'm using the verb to vie with its full strength. Huh? To vie implies struggling, striving for, uh, which means that we have to act for change, knowing that this implies, again, a struggle and an effort. Uh, and it's not an easy path, as we have heard this morning. And the third thing is, well, the importance of taking risks. Taking risks in life in general is important, <laughs> but also in, in our work, because uh, we have to allow ourselves to take risks and to work by trial and error and allow ourselves a margin of error always, uh, because from error also one learns. And, you know, cognitive psychology talks a lot about the comfort zone. As human beings, we are programmed to work well in environments that allow for low st levels of stress and anxiety. But there is a further step, huh? which is the optimal performance zone. And to achieve that, uh, we need to also make space for a little bit of anxiety, for a little bit of stress, which comes from uh, taking risks as well. And if I think that, you know, that makes a big difference. If you step out of your comfort zone, you can go towards an optimal solution without falling into the trap of then making a whole chaos. That level of, you know, good management of that level of risk is also something that I think has, you know, come out of this conversation uh, this morning. So thank you all very, very much as far as we are concerned from the uh, Europe capacity building for European capitals of projects.